Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, coming this evening. This is what Robert Siegel looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, know you the, for that vote you know of the approval. Voice. Now you know the face. Uh, uh, and I have to tell you, uh, we've known each other for some 15 years or so. It was about that, about that long ago that I went over to Haynes Point one afternoon to get in nine rounds of, uh, nine holes of golf. And I walked up to the first tee and there was another guy there and he said, do you, you want to play around together? And I said, sure. I was by myself. And then he said, uh, these are back in the crossfire days, he said to me, you're not going to beat up on me like you beat up on Pat Buchanan, are you? <laughs> uh, he recognized my face, I recognized his voice. <laughs> Uh, and we have known each other and been uh, good friends since then. It's great to see you this evening, Robert. And I would also uh, welcome Jane Siegel, who is here with Carol tonight. So, Jane, nice to see you. Uh, and this is a very, very important night because uh, I'm sure all of you know we are now into day five of our fall membership drive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and our goal for this hour is $10,000. Uh, yep. So you can use your cell phones uh, anytime during the hour to make a pledge, or you can I'm just hand Robert your check on the way out. How we can. I, I, I am part of a bizarre social experiment, which is what if twice a year we made our programming almost completely unlistenable? Uh, <laughs> drove you away. Would you return the following week? That's the, and so, so far, so far, so good. So, so far, far, it's so working. Good. I heard you say today that public radio is an American treasure. Boy, that's really upping the ante to get money. Uh, is it? <laughs> you're, is it? you're talking about a, rec a recorded fundraising message that I made. Yeah. So, yes, it is. It is an American treasure. It's a, it is an institution which, if somebody had ever described this thing in 1970 when it began and said, here's how it's going to work. You know, we're going to have hundreds of public radio stations around the country, and uh, they'll pay... Uh, they'll get a little bit of money from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We'll beg three or four times a year. Uh, we'll get grants from foundations. Uh, uh, people who uh, uh, buy advertising time on radio will buy little, whatever it is, 14-word announcements from us and, and uh, uh, pay good money for it, even though they can't even have a call to action. They can't have a verb, <laughs> basically, in their, in their announcement. Uh, no one would believe this thing would ever work. Uh, it works because it's a, it's, it's, it's a radio network or system, uh, it's a journalism organization and other things, and it's a civic activity. Uh, and in, in, uh, all, all over the country, people find cause to support their public radio station, and as a result, I think, uh, I think it, is, it is kind of a treasure. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a treasure, and I think we're blessed to have you, uh, and I think it's the best uh, uh, journalism you can find anywhere, not just your show, but uh, the you. entire network. But the, and it was a time not so long ago when you were the favorite target of the right wingers who were, the, I mean, their mission was to shut down public radio. You don't hear that much anymore. How did you scare them away or what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think through sheer endurance is what it is. I think if you hang around long enough, I still, I mean, I, uh, I have no idea whether the issue of defunding uh, public broadcasting will arise again. I, I assume it will at, at some point. Uh, but um, I think that a lot of people who used to talk about us a lot didn't listen to us. And at some point, we heard from a number of conservative members of the House, you know, I, I find myself listening to Morning Edition and to All Things Considered. And you know, it, it's not that bad. You know, it's actually, uh, now, that I, now that I've listened to it, it's, it's, it's really not that bad. And I, and I think that um, We've won over quite a few. The, the public dollars, by the way, are about, I think they're about 10% of the mm -hmm. public radio economy. Uh, if they disappeared, it would, be a, it would be a hit. It would hurt. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a fatal blow. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we're not without our critics, let's put it that way. Neither from the left, uh, from the right, nor from the left are we without our critics. So. Uh, while we're talking business talk, yeah. so... Uh, what time do you get in every day, and how long does it take you to prepare the show? And when uh, do you start preparing the show? Well, I, I never stop preparing the show because uh, I, I do a lot of book interviews and um, movie interviews and music interviews. So there's a lot of homework, uh, things to watch, things to listen to, and, and uh, books to read. 
uh, for me, I mean, I, I'm lucky. I was, you know, Steve Inskeep is in there at you know, 1.30 in the morning or something. I, I get in uh, a little after 9. Uh, we've just decided that it would be best for our program to have its daily meeting at 9.30 instead of 10. Uh, I, which means that I experienced the rush hour from Arlington a little bit earlier uh, than I was until a couple of weeks ago. And there's a meeting and the entire day is spent both uh, doing things for that day's program and doing uh, interviews and, and writing stories for future programs. Uh, and by about 3.30 in the afternoon, we're in the studio. And the show that we do from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. is the live program. Uh, tonight we were because there's a, a, a pretty uh, uh, important and, and discouraging breaking story out of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still on the air live uh, until about 6.15. But uh, there's always one host who is the late duty host. When it's me, it, it, this is my week actually, so we have an ISDN line uh, to the house. And when we have to update, if I'm home, I get on the air and we, we, we broadcast from home. Audie Cornish took over so that I could be with you. Uh, Audie is doing that tonight. So. Yeah. Um, the disaster in Canada is hers from here on in. And um, so when you actually go live, how much of it then is live and how much has been pre-recorded? Do you want me to open uh, that for you? Or you no, no, I've got it. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> well, no, it's, 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 it's just it's my security bottle, bottle I've here. ever no. had to open. I just, uh, I'll tell you, it's a good question. What you ask is a good question. In 1976, uh, as the radio station that I worked at in New York had just been sold by the most ethical licensee in America, the Riverside Church in the city of New York, to one of the most unscrupulous broadcast companies that ever walked. And I realized I had to get out of this, of, of this place. I came to visit NPR, and the, uh, the uh, two things struck me about All Things Considered, which was the only daily program we had then, the only big daily program. Mm -hmm. And the first was that for a program hosted by Susan Stamberg and Bob Edwards, for a program that sounded amazingly live to me, it was the most pre-recorded, <laughs> uh, edited <laughs> broadcast I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, and second, when the program, which was then only 90 minutes, not two hours, began, they actually hadn't finished producing the end of the program. They would, would go on the air at five, and people were still busily putting together what would be on the air at, at six. So it's, that was 1976. This is mm -hmm. you know, a thousand years later uh, now. It is still the most unlive broadcast uh, <laughs> that anyone is aware of. It's, it is a very edited program, and we would much rather talk with somebody for eight minutes and edit to get the best, most concise uh, four and put that on the air, uh, then have somebody uh, evading our questions for four minutes and uh, in live uh, uh, or giving, giving very boring answers for four minutes. Uh, so it's a very uh, pre-recorded program, a very heavily edited program. Do you find that way, though, that, uh, that events in the news can overtake you? Uh, well, so you've recorded something which is and now passe. And so we go live. And yeah. So then we go live. So today we led uh, each of our hours with the shootings in Ottawa, yeah. and that's all live. Uh, and, uh, and of course, when we go live, the uh, person we're talking to, may their answer may run over the allotted time, and the director goes nuts because yeah. uh, the next item is recorded, and, and pretty soon we'll, you know, we'll blow into the, across the, what we call the post, where the station is busy doing its, its vital fundraising. Mm -hmm. But that's live radio. So that's, that's live radio, yeah. What kind of feedback do you get, and in what form? Do you get a lot of uh, email, internet? You used to get phone calls and mail, I guess. Uh, I still mail, get, I still get a, a one, there's a kind of phone call I get, usually from people in Hawaii, who call <laughs> overnight. I don't know when they're hearing the show, and they're very, very cranky with what, uh, <laughs> what <they're, laughs> And they're very they're long. that way in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. I will come. I don't know. I thought they were very mellow. And, uh, but I will come in and sometimes hear an extremely long message, sometimes with a good point, uh, sometimes a little obsessive, uh, going on criticizing something that they'd heard in the program uh, from a Western time zone. Uh, and our, our phone operators and the like are very helpful to let anybody get through to our phones and, <laughs> and uh, leave whatever kind of message uh, they want to leave. Uh, Email, uh, lots of email, lots of social media uh, mm -hmm. uh, comment, and um, I guess below a certain age, it's, it's much more social media than, than even email. Right. We lost a giant in Ben Bradley. Yeah. Did you know Ben, and what impact uh, do you see that he has had on journalism in general? 
I met him. Uh, I met him. I, I can't say that I, uh, that I knew him. I know that uh, people who were very close to me at NPR, um, Dan Shore and uh, uh, Frank Mankiewicz, our, our president, uh, shortly after I got there, were close to Bradley and, and, uh, and thought the world of him. Uh, he's a very important figure. Uh, he, um, he set a standard for what news executives are supposed to do when you're uh, uh, ambitious, gifted, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes obnoxious young reporters go ahead and get stories that their betters are too busy or too wise uh, to report. Uh, and you, you stand by them and you, presumably with a Catherine Graham behind you, you, you're prepared to take the institution to the brink for the principle of, of uh, solid good reporting. And uh, so he's, you know, I, I, there's nothing more honorable than that. And he, of course, the downside is that he and Woodward and Bernstein inspired like 30 times as many young people to want to become journalists <laughs> as there are jobs in journalism <laughs> at, any, at any given moment. So uh, they, they turned this into a glamorous uh, a profession and, um, you know, it did much for journalism enrollment. I don't know how many of those people ever found jobs. Well, you know, when you're played by Jason Robart. I mean, yeah, it's pretty not, big, pretty, yeah. it's, it's not, pretty cool, it's yes. Uh, Carol and I were not in Washington at the time. I think you and Jane were, but he also transformed with the Pentagon Papers, with Watergate, transformed the Washington Post yeah. into, re re remarkably, correct? I mean. Yeah, the question, I, I really uh, came to know very well, I mean, one of, uh, well, his successor at the paper was Len Downey. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were London correspondents together. Oh. And, uh, and knew each other there quite well. And, and the question that I really, I was interested if I would ever get an interview with Jeff Bezos. And you, can, uh, you can use the question. Right, the question I, I would ask him is, what does the Washington mean in the Washington Post? That is, um, does it mean what Wall Street means in the Wall Street Journal? That is not a, not a physical place that you are the newspaper of, but an activity, a, a, a slice of American life, politics, politics and the federal government. Uh, and um, I think in years past, even as Bradley revolutionized the paper, uh, the paper uh, tried to remain very much a paper of the physical, geographical Washington, D.C. And it, uh, it, it maybe was caught off guard and didn't become a national paper in the way that the New York Times uh, did. But it, it was very devoted to the city of Washington and to the region. So. Right. And since Bradley, it's... One, right, one well, of the best papers. It, it is. I mean, it, yeah. it, it became, a, uh, you know, uh, you know you, when, when, you're, when your news organization is muttered in the same breath as the Washington Post, you feel pretty good about that. Right. So uh, that's, his, that's his doing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, b b by the way, <laughs> you know, I, I, he is, I think, the best interviewer in the business, right? right. So it's a little intimidating tonight. I, right? I, I would feel much more comfortable in your chair than in mine. So if you'd like me to start You want to trade you, places? I can, I, can, I can talk to you. You have good stories from California to tell us from, from a lifetime here. Let's talk a little bit about that. You mentioned Canada. What do we yeah. know about Canada? What, Canada I was at the briefing today at the White House, and yeah. the questions were, is this an act of, of terror? Do we know? Are there, are there well, more, it's how still big a, is this? How many people are involved? What, 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 what did you learn? When I, as I left uh, at about 6.20 or so, uh, a shooter had been identified. Uh, and um, uh, while everyone was being very cautious about using the word terror attack, uh, he was identified as a, uh, a in some news sources, I mean, the Globe and Mail is not just some news sources, but as, mm -hmm. as a, a uh, kind of a guy with a petty, a record of petty crime who had converted to Islam, uh, perhaps in, uh, uh, no, he'd only been in jail for a day, but he, we'd, we'd heard that he was a, he was described as a convert. And there was some link, there's an alleged, we didn't go with this on the air because we, uh, we, um, we couldn't confirm what was on a particular website, but it was claimed that he, uh, in a Twitter feed that he habituated the same uh, site as the guy who two days ago ran into two Canadian soldiers and killed them. So the worst interpret, and we're talking about interpretation, not, uh, not an, a story that's been nailed down, but the worst reading of what happened today 
is something akin to what the Australians recently arrested uh, 40 people for, which was a Mideastern message to Australian jihadis to go and commit random acts of mm -hmm. murder in public, preferably, uh, filmed like the, uh, the British soldier who was, who was killed in public. So we don't, that, that would be the worst hypothesis uh, to work on right now, and I hope it's not. Were these, the uh, th there's uh, speculation too that these were foreign fighters who had come back to Canada. <laughs> This, uh, there is, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm dealing in things that, uh, that I've seen, in, in this case, uh, I think the Globe and Mail reporting, that both had had their passports pulled at some point. Whether that means they had traveled abroad uh, and were on a watch list as a result, uh, people may know by the time we're having this conversation, but I didn't, uh, we didn't have that. Uh, a related story, which I heard you do today, and um, was were the three girls from Denver, yeah. teenage girls, high school girls, yeah. who were uh, apprehended, arrested, and returned from Frankfurt, where they had flown to Frankfurt, allegedly on their way to Turkey, on their way to Syria to join ISIS. Yeah. Two Somali-American sisters and, a, and their Sudanese-American friend, 15, 16, 17, high school kids, fly off, uh, headed for Turkey, and uh, at Frankfurt Airport, uh, their they're stopped by German authorities, and it turns out they were evidently they had told they hadn't told their, their parents filed a missing persons report. Where you know where are our kids? Uh, but but while they hadn't told their parents, they told their friends. And again, social media, you Twitter, know, we're, Twitter, we're going off to uh, you know to to uh, join ISIS. Yeah, to to join the Islamic State. And it's uh, uh, I had just uh, interviewed a guy yesterday, an American who's a uh, an academic in Melbourne, Australia, who studied foreign fighters. He, he's very quick to point out that he says most of the fighters at the Alamo were nor Northern Europeans who were protecting uh, American women from the rapacious Mexican Spaniard Catholics who would get them. I mean, that he says there's a long history of people going off to strange foreign wars to, to fight in defense of the civilization that you are convinced is about to be destroyed if you don't. Uh, go there and fight for it. And the Spanish Civil War was full of foreign fighters who were fighting for a cause and the like. So these were young people who evidently felt that they would be you know, saving uh, a great cause if, if they would go to, uh, to Syria and take part in it. I have no idea what the kids are minors, and, it's, and, and so their names haven't been released. Uh, you asked a good question yeah. today, which is, well, I'm very nervous about this water bottle. That you I've have got the, it's the caps on. You don't have to worry about it, Bill. <laughs> but I'm not going to throw water at no, you. No, no, but I mean, don't you want to open it? Don't you want to well, open it's it? Just my, it's my security thing. All right, thing okay. Here. Right. That's a bottle. It's, uh, yeah. You asked the question today. What, so they got on a plane, they flew to Germany. Yeah. What do you charge them with? Or do you charge them? What crime yeah, did they commit? No, in, in, uh, tra going to Frankfurt Airport, which... I mean, I think you should get points for ever sitting in Frankfurt Airport. Right. Right? It's uh, one of the... Right. Anyone who's done any yeah. foreign reporting... In, in Europe uh, has spent too much time in Frankfurt Airport. Uh, but um, traveling to Germany isn't a violation of the law, I don't right, think. Uh, right. Traveling uh, to Turkey isn't against the law. So it all depends, as our, uh, I think, very sharp reporter from Colorado Public Radio uh, put it, it depends on what, if any, direct contact they had had with someone from the Islamic State, with some real intent. And then it depends on whether the authorities take three teenage girls as, you know, People may really want to, you know, do we really want to send these kids to federal penitentiary, or uh, is there some, you know, youth crime diversion program they might be uh, better well put in? Yeah. So uh, we don't know. Um, on another topic, how guilty do you feel about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> good start. <laughs> right. About the media overkill on Ebola. Or do you think there I, has been? Well, we have, we have covered Ebola a great deal. I think we've covered it very responsibly. Uh, and um, uh, on the other hand, the, the result of the coverage of Ebola has, first of all, it's turned Ebola into a national political issue. Uh, we have to date, I mean, we have to date had um, a person die in the United States of, of Ebola. Uh, the Spanish nurse who contracted Ebola has been discharged from the hospital in Madrid, 
healthy. Uh, we have had the man who died of, of Ebola transmitted the virus to two people who were uh, intimately involved with his bodily fluids because they were nurses and they probably weren't uh, protected sufficiently. But the dozens of other people whom he had contact with so far as Zippo. So the statement that it's a hard disease to, to contract seems to be borne out by the numbers in the United States. In our reporters who were reporting from Liberia and also Sierra Leone, I thought did some of the best reporting uh, that I've, you know, that I can remember. Uh, uh, we have a, um, a very new reporter, actually, Nurit Eisenman, who came to us from the Washington Post, who did stuff from Monrovia that I thought was just uh, uh, spectacular reporting. And um, there they have a, a, a massive epidemic. Uh, and um, we were very early to have Frieden of the CDC say that the numbers, the Liberian numbers were way off. It was gonna be you know, many, many times the number of cases than what they were uh, reporting, he told me. But uh, what I find disturbing about this is, and we pointed it out on the air, is that you know, more people will die of, uh, of many flu. other, the flu, uh, yeah. than will die in the United States in all likelihood of Ebola. Um, and um, and it, was, it was pointed out to me by my brother-in-law yesterday, my Jane, Jane's brother was visiting, who said half of what you do, I tune in, half of what I hear is about Ebola. So the question was, is that true, Robert? So the, well, if you listen at the top of the hour and we lead a lot of our segments with Ebola and you listen for 15 minutes, it's possible that half of what you heard is about, is about Ebola. If you right. listen for 40 minutes, you'll still hear the same amount of time about Ebola, maybe with another news spot. Um, so uh, depending on how you listen, it can, it can be overloaded. So I, I'm very torn about it. I, I don't think that, um, uh, that we should stop reporting on this, uh, but um, uh, boy, the, the impact on the public is just, um, uh, it's, it's staggering. Just on a personal note, I was in Dallas Sunday through Tuesday uh, at a conference, and when I left Dallas yesterday morning, the headline in the Dallas Morning News was, North Texas returns to normal. Um, yeah. Well, of course, nor normal in Texas is, <laughs> uh, is a relative term, for sure. Was but that because the Cowboys had, had won <laughs> the, the, the... It was yeah. because 51 people had, We're been, no longer under quarantine. had been released from quarantine. Yeah. The hospital had reopened for business, the emergency room, everything was yeah. normal. The kids were back in school. And, and I said, and I came back, and Carol and I watched the news last night, and you would think people were dropping dead from Ebola on every street corner. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, so I was wondering when the rest of the country would return to normal. You know, take a while to catch up maybe to Dallas, <laughs> which is ground zero. Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah right. no, it's, the one, it's the one case. Uh, Have you ever counted up, unfair question, how many interviews you've done over the year? And do you have, uh, is the one that like really surprised the hell out of you? Is the one that you went into and, and really came out of saying, whoa, I didn't expect that? That happens a lot, actually. <laughs> actually, no, that, that happens a lot. Uh, the, I mean, the, look, the most, uh, I mean, for me, I think the most memorable interview in the studio was uh, with Mel Brooks. Uh, oh, my God. Which, uh, <laughs> which included the following. It was, uh, and I had, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who for a number of years could recite entire passages from the 2,000-year-old man albums. I mean, I could, I, I knew many of them by heart and uh, could do it and, <laughs> and loved uh, Mel Brooks albums and all that. And this was after the producers had been made into a musical on mm. Broadway and Brooks was mm. nominated for a Tony Award. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Tony was for composing the music for the producer, which he did, he wrote the songs. So um, the original interview in studio must have lasted about half an hour, the recording. And every time I asked him a question, he would say, Siegel, play the music, just play the music. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, uh, you know, I, I said, just play the music, Siegel, play the music. Uh, and uh, after many <laughs> interventions of this, of this kind, uh, he said, look, what time does this show start again? I said, I said uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, so I figure that by four o'clock in the afternoon, the Tony jurors should just about be waking up from their cosmopolitan drunken stupor the night before. <laughs> they'll turn on the radio, they'll hear my music, <laughs> 
and they'll vote oh, me a Tony. Uh, they'll vote me a Tony. So just play the music. <laughs> just play the music. <laughs> and uh, we, we kept a lot of this exchange. And he said, um, he said, because if I win a Tony, oh, yeah. I will then have won an Oscar, uh, a Grammy. What else is there? There's something else. An Emmy and a Tony. And I could sell them on eBay for $100. <laughs> and, and, but, uh, so, and it was just, it was, that was the experience of feeling more out of control and talking with someone. You say, you know, had that been live radio, uh, it would have been unbearable. But um, I did then receive in the mail a very nice poster for the producer's sign mm. saying, sorry about Siegel, exclamation point, Mel Brooks. So I was very... Uh, uh, any president? Have you interviewed uh, how uh, many presidents? Clinton on the... Mara Liasson and I had a pre-State of the Union address interview with Bill Clinton. Uh, and later, I've, I've interviewed Barack Obama as well. But, but this was um, uh, on the day of the... I think the day of the State of the Union. Uh, and uh, that morning, the Washington Post broke a story that the president was under investigation for a relationship with an intern. So uh, we had about a, um, we were supposed to be there at about 11 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> and uh, they kept on having emergency meetings. <laughs> so they pushed us off until we finally, actually, uh, did it live from the Oval Office. Whoa. And, yeah. Live? And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had a line and um, we, uh, you know, I asked him about it and he did tell me that uh, this, you know, that he knew no more about this than I did, which was, you know, <laughs> I thought that was a strange answer. But, um, but I, I was, I really, as I thought about this, I felt that the correct answer for him to tell me when I asked him about these reports of a relationship with the, an intern was. How did you ask that question? Very, very sheepishly, very, uh, very, very uh, uh, ambivalently. And, um, and he said, I thought the correct answer was, Mr. Siegel, that's none of your business, it's none of the Congress's business, and it's none of the special prosecutor's business. Mm -hmm. In which case, I was prepared to say, Mara, you know, in Europe, <laughs> Europe. <laughs> we went around about five or six minutes with him on it, and, um, uh, and then we moved on to other issues in the State of the Union. The most, uh, I, I found something, uh, I was struck by something very clever a few years later, the special prosecutor filed his special report. I think I'm now, enough years have passed that I can say that I received this very official certified letter saying that I am mentioned uh, in the report of the special prosecutor uh, and, um, or independent counsel, whatever, and I should come to the Court of Appeals, whoever, or the, the courthouse, to see the citation to prove of, uh, to see if I had any dispute with the way that my words were being I thought that was just really strange. And, and do not tell anybody that, that you're going to do this. So I go one day at lunch hour, I walk in, and um, if you look in the report that was eventually released, the independent counsel did something that I thought was quite a clever piece of lawyering, which was uh, there was a question, did the president, when he declined to answer, or, or when he answered at the grand jury, was he momentarily befuddled? And uh, answering, you know, he, he just, he, he didn't quite have, uh, have it all together. And what they did was they gathered what he had told uh, me. Um, this, the other two first day people were Mort Kondracki, I think, Mort Kondracki, who was editing the, the roll call. Roll call. And uh, Jim Lehrer uh, had, had an interview the same day. And what they saw was that he had told us exactly the same thing that he then said before the grand jury. And so the argument was made that clearly it was a rehearsed um, and prepared remark, which I thought was, um, uh, I had to actually admire the cleverness of the, of the prosecutor in putting that argument in. But then he decided that it wasn't worth uh, pursuing uh, with, with the prosecution. So uh, that, was the, um, that was a pretty strange interview. Did you ever think about working in television? Yes, uh, I, um, I, it's you still the, have a face for radio. I, I do have a face for radio. <laughs> I, uh, I went, 
I, twice, twice. I, th I thought about it twice. Um, I went to a journalism school uh, after working at a radio station, uh, figuring that I really had better get involved in a medium where you actually can make a living as an adult. Uh, that uh, radio, as much fun as it was, and as much I had, as I'd fallen in love with this in college radio, was a, uh, you know, it, it had been killed off by television. Uh, right, so. Uh, you couldn't do anything longer than 60 seconds, and um, I'd probably better transition into a, 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 a medium in which you, you might be able to uh, actually survive. And went to uh, uh, Columbia, which were where I'd gone to college, with the intent of, I figured I'd go there and I'd meet Fred Friendly and I'd learn something about television and I could get a job in television. So um, I, uh, I went there and um, I was the stringer for WCBS TV, the big channel oh, two. In yeah. And uh, my job was to send them a story suggestion every month, which I did for $25. And then if I did the best story suggestion of any college stringer in the New York area, I'd get another $25. And I consistently, I, I, you know, six months out of nine, I got the extra twenty. You didn't do the stories. None no. of the story was ever done. None of my <laughs> suggestions. I mean, these were suggestions to them to cover. You know, and yeah. none of the stories was ever done. But uh, they kept the, the city editor, who was a, a great old newspaper man, uh, thought they were really good ideas. But he had a, clearly had a different category in his mind for really good ideas and what you really did in life. You know, the real, real stuff. You know. uh, so at the end of the year, I was offered a, uh, you know, a job as a desk assistant. And it was my... Um, uh, path not taken moment, and uh, <laughs> and I just didn't feel I just didn't feel good about it, and um, I sort of took a year of uh, idle unemployment, and then a, a radio station came along. Uh, you you can see I know I feel guilty now myself hogging all of this time. You're next. I just have one last question, but get your questions ready. But I do want to ask you. So, growing up, you know we are of a certain age. Yeah. Um, you must have listened, as I did, to radio with your family. Yeah. What was your favorite radio shows growing up? Well, or one. I, I'll, you know, this just drives my wife crazy to this day that I'm, I'm just young enough, I'm just young enough to have really missed the, the golden age of radio. I mean, by the time I was coming up, Gunsmoke was much more a television show than a radio show. But I loved Johnny Dollar, the man with the action-packed expense <laughs> account, and still listen to it on, uh, on WAMU on Sunday nights. Uh, Johnny Dollar, America's, uh, whatever it is, uh, celebrity insurance investigator, the man with the action-packed expense account. And, uh, and I, still, I can still remember hearing these shows as a kid, and I, I love hearing them uh, uh, now. There were some great but shows around at the time. I remember. Uh, I grew up hearing. Um, I used to listen to the Lone Ranger. You know. Yeah, um, there in New York, there was a morning uh, program before they converted to being all news, uh, which Jack Sterling did. Uh, Jack Sterling was also the ringmaster on the Seal Test Big Top Circus on television, and it was a show with a band. A uh, the Tyree Glenn Quintet played in the studio. Yeah, uh, Tyree Glenn was actually a great jazz musician, and and. Um, like, Har like uh, Garrison Keillor, he had an imaginary town in upstate New York, and he would interview himself as the newspaper editor, and it was very ambitious, entertaining radio. Uh, and um, I grew up listening to that and hearing the CBS World News Roundup. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great uh, kick for me to, uh, to then meet Dan Shore, from whom I'd learned they'd put up a wall in Berlin, because I heard him say it on the World News Roundup. Right. Uh, what fun to visit with uh, Robert Siegel. Huh? Uh, now can I interview you? No, we can no. keep going. We can keep oh, going oh, okay. and going. But uh, I know you're bristling with questions. Now we have the microphone. Is there more than one or just? Just one. You got it. Right here, I think. And then we'll come over to you, please. Yeah. Robert, thank you for, uh, for speaking. You're welcome. You have a, a show called All Things Considered, but it's my view that really it's some things considered. What causes you to consider some rather than others? <laughs> uh, well, you know, my, my uh, uh, appeal to the staff is always that every program should be a mix of things that are predictable and surprising. And that uh, if we didn't sound like the same program that was addressing 
some similar things, we wouldn't be predictable enough. You, you, you would have nothing, you have no confidence in what you were tuning in for. But you ought to hear something that uh, you hadn't expected to, um, uh, to hear about. So the all, we, the, the all is not absolute. Uh, it's always a work in progress. Uh, but there is some conscious effort uh, within the staff to do things uh, just because we haven't done them uh, uh, before. And uh, I'd say that we, uh, we try to cover as much of the world in terms of international coverage uh, as we can. Um, we, uh, our, our science coverage is something I'm very proud of. Uh, mm -hmm. There are spots, you know, that I I'd, I'd, you know, could imagine us doing a lot better, but um, our breadth is, a, is, is, is uh, something that um, is important, and we worry when we know that you've heard each hour begin with either Ebola or Kobani, Syria, uh, for several days running. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a character defect for, for an intelligent person to say, I think I've heard this in substance already, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, this is only an, uh, a, uh, an incremental change. But we try to consider, we try to go beyond our own personal narrow interests to, to, uh, to broader interests. Um, I had a question about an interview from some years past, and I hope I'm re recalling this correctly. My husband and I were very impressed with your interview of Vladimir Putin very long time ago. As he, phone in show. A phone in show, exactly. Yes, right, right. And your questions and your moderating of that. But with the passage of time, wondering on your reflections and whether you would ever welcome an opportunity to see if you could inquire as to the change in his philosophy over time. I would welcome it. Uh, you know, let me explain that um, one day, this is uh, uh, Kevin Close, who was then the president of NPR and a former Washington Post uh, mm -hmm. Moscow bureau chief, uh, comes to me and says, you're not going to believe this. Uh, a, a, a couple of Russians have come to me and they've asked, do we want to do a phone-in show with Vladimir Putin? <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and the, the, logic was, the logic was that Bill Clinton had gone to Moscow and gone on uh, Echo Moskvi, the, the, the independent radio station, and done a phone-in show. So uh, in what I learned was a Russian obsession with uh, being treated equally, that all things should be, you know, you must be perfectly equal in your treatment. Putin was coming to America. He should be on an American uh, program, uh, call-in show. And... Um, we solicited questions from the audience, and I went in with index cards, which was great because when you have index cards and you're reading off other people's questions, there need be no logic to the way in which you ask them. It's, it's very liberating. You can say, here's another question, and it has nothing to do with anything that's been said. So I, I fell in love with the idea of soliciting questions from the audience. But I'll tell you a great, um, a great story about this, which is uh, Putin goes to New York, and... Uh, uh, Dmitri, Dmitri the advanced man, is engaged in uh, excited, wild conversations on the phone as we're waiting for Putin to come from ground zero to our then bureau on, on 43rd Street. And what we'd done is we'd cut out two hours of a broadcast, one hour of which would be the phone in with Putin whenever he arrived. And oh. we'd, we'd, we'd sort of <laughs> swathe them because we didn't know. So we'd begin with a round table in Washington. We'd end with a round table in Washington. And whenever Putin got there, that would be the hour with Putin. And I don't speak Russian. My daughter speaks Russian. My daughter, is a, she's a, 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 a PhD Slavicist. So I brought her along. And we had a close to new Russian. Michelle Kellerman our, our, was a Russia correspondent. She knew Russian. Dmitry is going nuts. And what's the matter? I said, Dmitry, what's the problem? He says, they want... They want the president, I mean, they want the president to, to, to pose, to be with, with Giuliani. I said, you know, I said, you know, every, at this particular, it's December of 2001. I mean, everyone in the world wants to have a picture taken with Rudy Giuliani. I said, what's, what's the matter? He says, he's a president. He's a president. President does not stand with a mayor. You know, you don't, you don't, uh, it's protocol. You don't have a president together with a mayor. So, uh, of course, Michael says, well, will he get in the car soon and come here uptown? <laughs> That's Michael. He says, we'll figure something. We'll figure something out. We'll figure something out, Robert. We'll something out. And um, what he did was, if you go back to the coverage, he went over and looked over the edge at the site and sort of ruminated uh, very uh, pensively on the scene of destruction and um, did not actually 
do the photo op with Rudy Giuliani. Uh, he, uh, they then sped up town and we spent our hour together and uh, he, uh, I, I, I can't tell you how often I've wished that I had the hour back again to ask questions that have, uh, oh, yeah. that, I've, that I've had since. But, uh, but boy, did they believe in equality, you know, yeah. treat us, treat us, and, and it's, treat us the way we treat you. Yeah. Right here. Uh, Hi. Question and we'll come over here next time, sorry. Yeah. I worked with Bill Seemering in Buffalo in the 60s. How would you characterize his contribution to National Public Radio? Seminal and inspirational. And one other question, what's become of Sylvia Pajoli? Sylvia Pajoli is still in Rome. She's still there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me say, Bill Seemering, who is in, who is in Buffalo, was the, uh, <laughs> the original producer of All Things Considered. And um, when I met him, he was uh, the manager of our station in Philadelphia and sat on the board of, of NPR. And he was really a terrifically creative um, uh, thinker about broadcasting and I think very much uh, contributed to the, um, uh, the tone of All Things Considered and NPR generally. And Sylvia Pajoli, I loved her just to hear her pronounce her name. <laughs> Now, I, nobody could say it the way she did. Just so great. Yes. Hi. I forgot about her. Thank you. Oh. Uh, what do we do, Diana? Real fast? Oh, I'll do that. Okay. It's like the old Saturday Night Live joke, you know. The human microphone, actually. All right, so I'll just summarize the question briefly is maybe a, 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 sort of like what do you, how do you make your decisions, what goes in and what doesn't, and also how do you make sure that all things considered just not a copycat of Morning Edition or vice versa? Uh, the, the answer to, well, the how is a very, I, I'm not sure I can even describe how we decide what goes in because it's through a series of meetings and a combination of our requests, what we'd like reporters to do, and reporters' requests, what they would like to do, and their editors' requests, of what they don't want them to do. Uh, but the issue of not repeating what's on Morning Edition is, um, uh, that's, that's actually quite important to us. Uh, we feel that, uh, you know, one, the people who see the glass as being, whatever it is, uh, uh, you know, one-eighth full, uh, uh, would say that if you, the odds of hearing the same story, if you ran the same story on Morning Edition and All Things Considered, only one listener in whatever it is, a dozen or something, would hear the, the same story twice. So some people might say, well, why not just repeat everything? Uh, and um, uh, our attitude is that, you know, that would be a, a, a spiral, that would be a vicious circle in which you would keep on hearing the same thing and nothing turns people away like thinking, I've heard this already, or uh, in substance, or this is a little different. We made an exception last night. Uh, from home last night, I was involved in our putting the Ben Bradley uh, obituary on, but it was for the last feed of All Things Considered from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., uh, which is really for the West Coast. And uh, really most of our listening is, is happening earlier than that. And so Morning Edition decided that to not run David Falkenflick's really good obituary uh, for Ben Bradley that had been on the shelf and had been produced in advance, would have been nuts. So they ran, the, um, they ran it again. And it was a rare case of our, of our running the same story once, uh, late on All Things Considered, and then on Morning Edition. But uh, it's a huge concern. Let's not, um, uh, let's not interview the same people. Uh, let's not, uh, uh, if Sylvia Pajoli, who's still there, you know, did a story about the, uh, the, the, the the church and the family uh, uh, for Morning Edition. We did it on Morning Edition. Uh, you know, we shouldn't do it again in All Things Considered. So. I'll come back to you, but we have the microphone here. Yes, um, hi. Yeah, this relates to what gets done and what doesn't get done. Um, you mentioned early on um, the response of the right and how that may be evolving or may not be. And of course, it's kind of fundraising week. And so that brings to me the question, um, a year or two ago, there was an issue with public television in Boston and a major donor that had some impact on 
what was or was not going to be done there. And I was wondering if you see that there's any danger of that um, happening in public radio. Um, I haven't, first of all, I haven't seen it or heard of it happening in public radio. I really, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not aware of that. I will say that um, uh, at, at the most recent staff meeting that we had, I heard someone say something, a colleague say something, which was the reverse of what I've heard over all these years. Uh, typically, you would hear people say, why don't we just get off of public money? Why don't we stop using, you know, a corporation for public broadcasting money and, and we'd, we'd be more independent? And that was always a sort of thing that news people would say about, the, um, about it. And at the most recent staff meeting, someone asked, are you concerned of our president, uh, Jarl Mohn? Uh, are you concerned about our losing uh, public money? Because if we did, we would lose our nature. We would lose our uh, definition as a public service, uh, by definition, nonpartisan broadcaster, which is sort of, which is, which is I, I thought was odd. I, I, I was very actually glad to hear it um, because I think that that dime on the dollar uh, defines us in a way uh, with the public service mission that, um, that's important. So far, um, our biggest donor ever uh, uh, did, uh, gave us $240 million in her will. Uh, it's, there's, there's no money like the kind of money that Joan Kroc left us, which was <laughs> massive, uh, basically unrestricted. It's for the endowment. Uh, and she's not around to complain about how it's being. Uh, <laughs> how it's being uh, there's no, no more generous gift than that uh, can, can be made. Um, uh, other networks, uh, commercial media, the news divisions struggle <laughs> to maintain their, the, the funding compared to the rest of the entertainment divisions. And, you know, NPR is many, many things. It's not just <laughs> news, although that's such an important component of it. And I, I wonder if there is any competition. And also, do you shudder when you hear Tom and Ray Maliazzi say, this is national public radio, <laughs> like they always say? No. I, in, my, in my four years of running NPR News, we launched Weekend Edition, first Saturday and then Sunday. Saturday was the, the only show we ever put on the air with Scott that was, from day one, a hugely successful popular program. No, no problems from, from the moment it went on. Sunday. It was always kind of a grab bag, but one thing we began with, well, two things we began from the very first shows in 85, I guess, were Will Shorts doing a puzzle uh, with Susan Stamberg, as it was then, and a segment of these two guys from WBUR, Tom and Ray Maiazzi, talking about, about cars. So uh, I, I, I was told, listen to this tape, I know it sounds nuts, that we'd want to put a car advice segment in Weekend Edition Sunday, but just listen to them, just listen to them. And uh, I listened to them, and after I peeled myself off the floor uh, from, from laughing, uh, I told the producer, all right, let's, let's put him on the show, let's do it. So uh, I, um, I, I feel very warmly toward them. They're now in sort of permanent reruns uh, because of a, of a health issue. Uh, uh, Tom had really had to stop doing uh, new shows. Uh, they pose an interesting question. We've never really had, uh, I guess we used to have My Word and My Music from the BBC, which ran years after some of the participants had died, I think, after uh, it was still on the air. But um, I love Tom and Ray Maiazzi. Um, you have to say, Car Talk is one of the best shows that's ever, ever, absolutely, ever. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I, I could listen to those reruns forever. Oh, no, yeah. they're, they're great. Except we're, we're you know, you're, you're not going to hear any, 2010 model cars discussed and, right. um, yeah. forever uh, on, on, uh, on car talk. No, they're, they're great, they're great. And then the same producer created Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Th those programs, um, who's a former, like two thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by former All Things Considered interns. Uh, the, the, the producers of those is, uh, is a former one, Doug, Doug Berman. Uh, no, I'd say the only real tension about resources uh, that I feel at NPR is not between news and other. Because, and although people who were in cultural program would feel that years ago they got um, cut off and that, and that we stopped doing uh, uh, classical music from, from Centra, which was, uh, you know, I think, I think a great loss. Uh, but uh, the other is the balance, which every news organization is struggling with, which is between, in our case, radio and digital media. And uh, where do we, 
where is the line between what they call the legacy medium and the new digital medium? And that's, that's, that's always an issue. So, um, uh, you know, not, not arts and not news and other. Hi, am. Time for a couple more and while we're in this corner. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the ways that social media has changed or uh, social media has changed the way you do your reporting and in particular Twitter, which seems to be shrinking what we get to 140 characters at a time. I'm the worst person to ask about this because I, I have a Twitter account because I have to have a Twitter account. And I sometimes when we're called upon to say on the air what our Twitter accounts are, I remember that I should tweet something. And uh, that's usually <laughs> about my daughter. You know, I, uh, I don't, I mean, personally, there have been moments when it, when it, it was a huge medium for news gathering. The biggest one was the, um, Marath the Boston Marathon bombing, when um, what people in the, c in the community of where the, uh, uh, the uh, Tsunayev was hiding, I guess, uh, and journalists were tweeting so rapidly ahead of any mass media that you could follow a conversation about where police were. You, n none of this was you know, particularly confirmed or anything, but you were getting so much at the same time of people saying, I'm seeing this happening right now, that um, to me it marked a moment of a, a different kind of news gathering where you were, you were sort of, uh, you, were, you were getting a lot, of, uh, a lot of information via Twitter. Uh, having said that, it's, it's, uh, it's, not my, it's not my generation, it's not my, uh, my way of communicating with people. So uh, it has, Sometimes it also tells us, hey, something is trending on Twitter. It must be important. Well, what is it? I don't know that it's important because it's trending on Twitter. It could be, could be half a dozen people who are, you know, trending. So, so it has definitely changed things. But that's, that to me was the, you know, uh, today we had, a we had a story about Canada. We had a tweet, a story about tweets involving the man named as the suspect who was shot in the, in the Ottawa shootings. I don't know. I mean... I don't know whether he visited this site, the same site as the man who ran over the soldiers two days earlier. It's, um, there's a lot of little tiny bits of data out there and lots of bits of opinion out there. And um, I, I've probably made less good use of it than many, many of my colleagues have. Jim, just a, a footnote. One of the, one of the things that, um, that with my show that we have adopted is um, we will not have a guest on the show unless they agree to tweet ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Like the night before that they're going to be on my show in the morning and here's how you find it. And then be, uh, before they come on the show, then as the show is starting, that hour is starting, they tweet again. And in the middle of the interview, they, I mean, we, we, re yeah. we basically it's, look, beat them up unless they get, keep tweeting. Um, and, you, you know, you just pick up a lot of of uh, viewers and no, listeners that way. It's a lot of, it, it's, I... I'm sure your staff is doing that. You probably don't oh, even no. know it. Oh, no, actually, no, no, I know it. I mean, actually, Melissa Block will tweet things, as she's sitting next to me, about what I just said off the air. <laughs> she, will, she knows, she understands how seldom I will do this. And I think she's trying to, you know, save my honor. No, it's an <laughs> ongoing conversation. Yes, ma'am. Well, there is a lot of talk about the change in the relationship between Congress and the White House and journalists and Congress and the White House. And I just wondered what your take is on it and if you have in fact <coughs> seen this change, do you lament the change or do you think we'll get back what so many feel was healthier? Um, our, I mean, our people who really live with the White House or the Congress day in, day out, that is to say our White House reporters and our congressional uh, reporters, uh, they would ex they experience whatever change that is. Um, I'm not sure how much in their dealings with the media, the Hill has changed. I mean, I think that it's, um, I, I, they don't do anything anymore in Congress, so they don't have as much to talk about, but <laughs> they seem to, you know, be reasonably accessible. The White House, I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's not, um, it doesn't seem to be a White House that gives a lot of inside information to, to a broad group of reporters. On the other hand, I, 
they seem to put out a lot of stuff out there. I mean, it, I've, our, our correspondents have had it, you know, they've, uh, they might have found the Clinton White House more talkative. But um, a, I, I've never heard Scott Horsley, or now it's Tamara Keith, or before that Mara, especially complain about uh, their dealings. Not a lot of news conferences, but that seems to be a, um, a trend generally. So I, I, I don't feel the big change. I mean, I think the changes in the way the politicians relate to one another are much, much more significant than the changes in the way that they relate to, to journalists. We, uh, sir, do you have the last question? A lot of the pressure is on, so. Uh. All right, I want to twit you about tweeting. Okay. And uh, there was this, uh, yesterday I read, and got online to read it, a Pew Center of Journalism report about trust. And the, their lead was that Rush Limbaugh was the most untrust, in their survey, untrustworthy person. Right. The, and I'm not going to have it right, but then CBS, the major news networks were the, quote, most trusted, about 50%. NPR came in at 40-some-odd percent as far as being right. trustworthy. But my question is, but it said overall younger people have much less trust of the media. So mm -hmm. that was my question about your observations on what, you know, this is dangerous to me, what this portends maybe for the future. Yes, uh, I think that there are, there are lots of questions about young, young people, in our case, you know, young listeners or whatever. Uh, they, uh, they've, they've come of age in a very, very different media environment than their parents or grandparents uh, did. Uh, they, um, for, I mean, from a standpoint of someone who works in, in, a, in an industry that, that Re relies on philanthropy, uh, if you come up with the web, you've come up in an environment where you assume that everything's there for free, or it should be. And you should get music for free, you should be able to get whatever you want and, and take it, and uh, uh, something that, that prevents you from getting a, a sound file is uh, standing in the way of you know, a free access. So I'm, I'm a little worried about a generation that's come up with that sense when we tell them, you could have this for free, <laughs> we'd like you to pay us for it, uh, you'd like you to pay your station. Um, they have um, uh, certainly grown up in a, a not a great era of broadcast journalism. I mean, I don't think that a person of, in his, her or his early 20s has grown up with the same feelings about the people who broadcast to them uh, that uh, earlier generations might have had about uh, Morrow and Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley and John Chancellor mm -hmm. and the like. I think it's been a much more a diffuse and uh, uh, and and in some respects legitimately untrustworthy uh, era. Uh, I'm, I remember realizing at some point that when my kids were going to college, uh, listening to NPR had become the sign of being plugged into the greater world and following events in a way that when I went to college reading the New York Times uh, had been. And while I was happy that NPR, <laughs> you know, NPR occupied such status, uh, I think they should read the New York Times too. You know, I think it's the New York Times. Uh, I find in our meetings that our younger people, uh, when they're, and they mention an interesting story that they saw in the Times, uh, don't realize that it was the lead of, on the front page because they're not approaching the newspaper right, uh, yeah. physically. Uh, you know. So I guess it's good judgment that they found the most interesting story. But on the other hand, it's like, come on, you know, it's the most, <laughs> that's the most highly read uh, piece of news in the country. Um, uh, we always have the same problem, uh, I think, journalists and government, which is that uh, trust is restored through terrible things that happen and are somehow set right by positive actions. I think the Washington Post, Ben Bradley and the Washington Post did miracles for trust in newspapering. Uh, because they behaved uh, uh, conscientiously and heroically in, in bad times. So I don't, I don't wish the bad times on us uh, to, uh, to give an opportunity to reestablish trust with young people, but, um, but somehow I suspect that's how it has to, uh, that's how it has to happen. So, so let me just say, uh, back to where we started, uh, I don't know 
whether or not public radio is an American treasure, but Robert Siegel is an well, American that's treasure. That's <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much.